Uh, let's start with our first keynote. Uh, I'm just going to quickly introduce the folks here. Uh, the keynote has become an open source service. Let's, let's give people a few minutes to enter. No, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is amazing. We're having <laughs> DevConf again. <laughs> Woo! Closed, Those door closed. I think that's a sign, right? OK, we'll be talking about opening open services. And this is a, an interesting group of people, because we have folks who've been with the communities uh, in different projects for a while, who've been in different positions as well, right? Dealing with customers, dealing with developers, doing some real work and developing the services. Uh, so it's, it's something that we're all passionate about. We'll be talking about this topic for a while, also during the conference, so not only at the keynote. Um, I think we should do a really quick round of introduction uh, for people who don't, don't know us. My name is Radek Vokal, and I'm currently working at Red Hat as the product manager for a set of services that we call Insights. Uh, I've been at Red Hat for almost 20 years now. It's a little crazy. Uh, and yeah, Steph. I know I'm you for Steph ages Walter. as well. Yeah, I've been involved in open source for over 20 years. Um, this is not my real hair, in case anyone's wondering, <laughs> but if I don't wear it, I get booed off stage. Um, I lead uh, a lot of the RHEL engineering, Linux engineering, uh, satellite teams. So many people that I have joy and pleasure of working with are here as well. Over to you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Simon, um, and this is my real hair. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I've been uh, I've been working in open source for something like 15 years, and I've been at Reddit for two years, um, and I've had the amazing opportunity in these two years uh, to work with the very talented people in the Image Builder team. And uh, yeah, we are the first service uh, of this uh, HMS uh, sort of insights groups. Uh, uh, rail services uh, to be available publicly, and we're very proud of that and working to make it the service even more open going forward. Thanks. Hello, I'm Roberto Caratala. I'm a cloud services black belt, even though I, I don't know uh, a clue about uh, Kung Fu or anything else. <laughs> uh, and I'm working for Red Hat more than seven years, almost eight, and a pleasure to be here beside. <laughs> Uh, hello, I'm Tomáš Tomeček, uh, Radek and Ondra Vašik hired me actually 11 years ago. Uh, at and DEFCON, I never right? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, at DEFCON. <laughs> <laughs> and I never thought that I would be doing a keynote here, and I like <laughs> doing short introductions. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so let's, let's give you guys a first like, introduction, right? So why are we even talking about open why? source services, yeah. right? Why, why, why should we care? Why do we care about this? <laughs> I mean, come on. We've all been part of a massive monumental change that has made the world better. We have brought open source into every corner of software development. I mean, there's proprietary systems is now assumed that somewhere in the stack is a component that someone in open source has worked on, someone here. There's, there's open source uh, services, systems, operating systems, everything you can imagine that has open source permeated um, throughout everything. And this has brought humanity much further than proprietary software could. So when you walk into a Red Hat office and you see <laughs> one of these uh, signs um, from Mahatma Gandhi, you can easily assume that, OK, we won. We're done. This is great. Um, we have now utopia. It's all wonderful. Um, let's go home. And we're here to tell you that this is not the case. <laughs> There's a challenge ahead of us. There is a challenge to open source that if we don't address and we don't adapt to, will become a threat. And I'll explain to you why that is. Think back on your first open source change that you made to a component or something you were running. Now, for many of you, um, this has been around for maybe the whole time you've been working on, uh, on software. But for some of us, it blew our minds. Think back to when the first time you could actually change something, change the behavior of something on your computer, and you finally put in, maybe you changed the color of something, maybe you put in a, a, a printf, maybe you logged something and you changed the output of a command, and you, uh, it just blew my mind that this was possible. I'm surprised you found my first patch. This is your first <laughs> patch, it's very good. I couldn't find my first patch. It's, I mean, 
I didn't keep it. It was garbage. It was changing, I forget, something to pig Latin, and it was in fetch mail, I think. Um, but uh, what, think about what makes this actually possible. What makes this possible is that you have a copy of the software running on your computer. This is what made this possible for me. And the source code was shared in a way that I could actually change it, I could rebuild it, and so on. And the problem that we face is a lot of people, a lot of us, but a lot of people in the world no longer actually want to run a copy of the software. They want you to run that crap that you wrote. They don't want to run it. And, and they want to experience the output in the form of a service, in the form of an API that they call, in the form of infrastructure as a service. In one way or another, they want to use the software without actually having to run it, much less make a copy of it themselves. And so, we run into a paradox here, a conundrum that we need, and, and, I'll, and I'll walk through this uh, with you. The first thing is that open source thrives when it can convert some small percentage of the people who are using that software into contributors. Now, some projects, this happens a lot. This happens at a, at, a, at a fantastic pace where half the people become contributors, maybe developer tools or things like that. Other, in other cases, it's a small fraction, but there's some function here of people who are using the project actually decide to make a change or help uh, in some way. And conversely, uh, it starves when that can't happen. So if you prevent that function of users becoming a contributor to the software, open source starts to atrophy, regress. But our open source practices, most of them, require that you operate a copy of the software in order to change it, in order to tr even, even get the idea that you could make a change in, in, in order to play with it, in order to introspect it, in order to understand what's going on. But at the same time, the users of a service literally chose not to run the software themselves. They're using the service mostly because they want someone else to run it, or in some cases, it doesn't make sense to run this thing in another place. It makes sense to run it in one place. So they're unable, unwilling, or just uh, doesn't make sense to r copy the software and operate the software. So we're at a, at a paradox, a place where when we put all these things together, it doesn't add up. It is very hard to contribute to open source services. It's not natural. And, and the mechanism that we use that underpins much of open source, licenses, copyright, is about copying software. And therefore, and in services, you don't need to copy a service in order to be have a sec that, that software be successful, that software be used. So we, although those all those ingredients, we can still use them. We're not gonna throw away open source licenses, for example, but they are not sufficient to solve this paradox. And so I want, imagine a world, we're not there yet, but yes, imagine a world where you can actually go and look at what's running in the service that you're using. You can see the code, you can see the software. Imagine when you, when you call the API, you can understand what the hell is going on under the hood. You can see uh, the same way you can with, the, with a stack on, of, of Python or Node.js on your own machine. Imagine you could make a change and experience that change without operating it yourself. You can make that printf uh, or, or that, that change, or you could, you could translate it into pig Latin, or you could change the color of something in a service, and you can actually see the, the behavioral difference. That is a world where open source actually works with services, with software as a service. So. I think we need some rules, some guidelines, right? We actually... Yeah, well, <laughs> exactly. And this is real to d today. So that's what we're here <laughs> to talk about. It's not about, we wanted to introduce the challenge, the paradox, but what everyone, what we are doing mm. to start to address this problem. And so many people are involved, so there's so many different uh, ingredients mm. to this. One of them is that uh, together we figured out what are the basic requirements for an, uh, an open source services, a service? It's not just 
an open source license. It's not just sharing the code, although that's important. The first requirement is that you do share the code. It's the same with a, with a project, that all components and all, all the assets in the service are shared under an open source license and available to the public. That's fundamental, of course, but it's insufficient. And this, the second fundamental part that we need is that others can contribute in the same way as a team working on the service can. Whatever that mechanism is that you use to work on the service, to deploy, um, to, 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 to review pull requests, to accept those changes, to, to run tests and so on, others need to be able to do it in that same way. And by meeting these basic requirements for, uh, for an open source service, people can then take it further. They may not take it further, but they can take it further to perhaps operate it somewhere else or add capabilities and, and ways of working that people... Steph, this, this is all great, but is someone already doing all this stuff? Yes. Really? We're going to blow your mind about <laughs> it. This is happening today. I mean, it's not all perfect, but that's why we need to work on it together. Um, so... I think Tomash is actually working on something. He, he raised his hand immediately when we start saying someone is actually doing this re for real, right? Is, oh, this, this is the sign, sorry. Yeah, we definitely <laughs> need to make it and get it further. Uh, okay, so I think you might be confused by looking at the slide, so don't worry, that was my intention. <laughs> <laughs> but my colleague said that maybe I should explain what's in there. So I tried to collect a few techniques we are using in our open source services uh, and explain. So on the bottom you can see that's my favorite, it's uh, database dumps from production. And they are super helpful for everyone on the team and especially for the outside contributors. When you are working on your change locally, you can load it up with the production data and see how the change would feel in the production. That, that's really amazing. Just one pro tip, don't forget to remove all the passwords from the dump. <laughs> <laughs> And, and the whole top is filled with documentation and I, I can't stress it out how many times this saved my butt when I was trying to work on our, uh, on our service and I didn't know which OpenShift command I should run or how to access this or that and then I open our documentation which is like really perfect for deployment and for the architecture and I immediately knew what I need to do to like keep the production service running and don't trash the secrets or something like that. So it, it's, it's really essential, especially when you are struggling or there's some problem and you need to solve it like as soon as possible, like make sure that your deployment documentation is, is flawless. Uh, yeah, on the top right, sorry that shouldn't be there, uh, Simon will talk about it. <laughs> uh, but what Steph said, uh, so the minimal requirements are all the assets are open and everyone in the public can contribute. And it's really just minimum. I mean, when you meet that, when you open source your code and, and collaborators start uh, piling in, like, like that's the beginning for you. And there are many things you can do. For example, in our service, one thing that really helped us was opening up our planning process because we would always get these questions like, so what are I working on next or what's the current epic or even within the team, we sometimes didn't know what we want to work on. And as soon as we made a uh, Kanban board on, uh, on our GitHub namespace and everything's open, all our epics, what we are working on right now, it makes so many things much easier. So before I hand out the microphone, I would like to challenge everyone and think about what should be on this slide because I collected a few screenshots here and now that I kind of see it on the little screen, <laughs> I know there are many things missing and I would really love to see more solutions uh, and make it easier for everyone to, uh, for, as Steph said, so I can experience a change I'm working on and I don't need to deploy anything. Someone will do it for me, some system. So think about that and maybe when we do this in one or two years, this screenshot, uh, this slide will be so full that you won't be able to see anything. <laughs> right, and Tom, this, this sounds way too easy, right? <laughs> I think there must be something missing. It's not just about the code of the service, right? You have to still run it, deploy it somewhere. What are, what are the things that we're missing? Roberto, help so, me out. <laughs> When we are talking about software as a service, it's not only about the uh, code itself. The service and the, uh, the, the service itself is much more um, than just the code. It represents, for example, um, the service it represents the tip of the iceberg. 
for example, we have much more value in the service rather than this. If you show, we have the best practices that represents and manage uh, the different uh, service at scale. We have the automation and uh, the infrastructure that are running as well. We have the operational processes, the interconnected services, and all of these components and pieces are backed up by open source projects and repositories that you can and uh, enable the users to influence and to uh, make contributions in order to um, make changes to the software and the services that they are using. For example, Azure Red Hat OpenShift is a jointly uh, designed uh, service that runs in, the, um, in Azure itself and um, is designed by Microsoft and Red Hat and it's open source, so you can uh, go there, you can contribute, you can open issues and influence to the different software that you are using at scale. So Roberto, I have a challenge, right? So I know that there's a bunch of services out there. I'm running some of them, I'm using some of them. How can I tell that this is an open source service and I can just start contributing to that, right? Simon, you have an answer, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Go for I mean it. That, is a, that is a very, very good question, a very valid one, because it sort of ties into all the other things that were said mm. before me, like the thing that Steph said, you know, we're sort of used to a, a certain way of working with open source software. We know, you know, we download a software package, we have an idea of, you know, where is the source? I mean, we've just downloaded it. Um, uh, there is a disconnect, though, with services where we don't necessarily know where the source is, uh, uh, or we don't know where the documentation is, or we don't know how to find the standard operating procedures or the best practices of uh, the specific team that designed this very service. But you don't even know that the service is open source. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. You might not even know that a service is open source. That's right. even more fundamental. And the only way you can do this is by embedding something in the service that guides the user uh, to how to introspect the code or that shows it at the first glance, oh, this, is, uh, this service is open source. The same way that a fork me icon on GitHub tells you, oh, I can fork this code. I can actually work with it. It's open. And, uh, and this is, I think, something that we really need to work on that we're sort of piloting on some of the services that are open already, uh, as you can see in this screenshot. And the idea is to really sort of connect the two dots, you know, the running service uh, down to the source code uh, and to give users a way to, first of all, inspect the code and understand why an API is maybe not behaving the way that, you know, you're expecting or that the documentation told you uh, <laughs> uh, it would behave, or, um, or even how you could change it and how you could maybe introduce some typing or something, you know, into the API and make sure it doesn't break. But, I mean, one thing that uh, we haven't really addressed is why should any business care about this? Like, why should oh, anybody I, I invest an money into this? So here's the thing, right? So at the end of the day, the services that we're all working on and that we want to open source, uh, someone wants to monetize them. Someone wants to benefit from them. And I have an observation as a product manager about services that, from my perspective, are becoming successful. And there's a component that we didn't mention here, and I, I want to highlight here. Uh, a lot of these I, like services and things that you see, projects here, open source projects here, are actually opening up their ecosystem for further contribution. Something I would call a midstream, right? Where you can build extensions, integrations, plugins, different connectors. And this allows different people to pick up these services, pick up these projects, and extend them for their specific use cases and, and different purposes. Extend them beyond what the initial authors of the service even thought about, right? Uh, if you look, and again, at some of these examples, you basically realize that these are projects that were very much focused on a single use case at the beginning, single purpose again, but because they thought about, again, plug -in infrastructure, extensions, and additional things, these became hugely popular. And again, this midstream idea where different people can contribute on top of the service, they have access to APIs, they have access to a sort of a playground, mock data, and these kind of things is a huge thing. And again, that's where I see the services being successful but also then solving problems and solving challenges for some of my customers that, again, the initial authors of these services haven't even thought about. So I think that's something that uh, we should all think about as well. 
how to not just open source the service itself, how to op open source the ecosystem around that so others can easily contribute on top of your service, within your service as well. We've talked about a lot of things here, uh, and uh, we've touched on these things, right? But we need to go deeper. And because of that, we actually have a couple sessions during the during DEF CONF, and we welcome you to join these and, and challenge us and, and tell us how wrong we are or whether you're already doing something else and it works for your community, your use cases. Let's do a really quick introduction about all these talks that uh, we're going to be doing. So, Tomé, you and Neil are doing the first one, right? Uh, oh, yeah. So, we spoke about open source services right now for a few minutes, and you can actually experience the contribution process tomorrow, time 15. I don't know which room, uh, but the <laughs> title of the talk is up there. So, we have prepared a workshop for you when you can try contributing to our open source service. It will be just the front end, not the back end. And yeah, we invite you there. Uh, for any successful contribution, we have prepared some nice presents for you. And for the people who will come there, we really would like to challenge and think about how can we even extend that process to, to the back end, uh, for example, so that it's uh, so, so that anyone can make the contribution and experience it very easily and not build thousands of Docker images or whatever. and uh, and try to set it up themselves. So please come by. Perfect, perfect. So I see Neil over there. Hey. <laughs> uh, Roberto, you're doing a talk with Marcel here. Torsten as well, right? You, you're joining to session two now? <laughs> Just Marcel. What is your talk about? Yeah, if you are wondering how you can start contributing in these um, open source services, in focusing, for example, the cloud services as well, Marcel, uh, Held and I, we will uh, be talking about how much open source is in the cloud services and we will analyzing and discovering the different open source projects that are using in a real production, uh, managing the different um, managed clusters that uh, Red Hat cloud services uh, manage across the world. And uh, we will also present these different repositories, projects that you can get, you can um, influence on them and get inspiration uh, on that in your own projects. So you can uh, get some ideas in order to make it better. Perfect, perfect. Simon, you're talking into more details about this small icon, right? Yeah. Is it very just much about so. it or is there more? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so my talk will be very short. It will last like some. I, Two minutes, maybe, max. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, so my talk is on, uh, on Sunday afternoon. Uh, so the first challenge, of course, is for you all to be there, because it's <laughs> Sunday afternoon. <laughs> but let's challenge everyone. So uh, people don't know that your service is open source. Many of you run open source services. No question, you meet those requirements. People can contribute, and your code is shared. But everyone who's walking through, the users, don't know that it is open source. They don't know what code you're running and they don't know how to contribute. So come to Simon's talk. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we very much so. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> okay, I will make it longer than two minutes, but also not too long. Yeah, but the idea is, of course, you know, you know, figure this out. We have a proposal. We're piloting something already. You could see it in the screenshot. It's real. It's, it wasn't a mock-up. Uh, yeah, and I'm very interested to hear uh, your thoughts, of course. Yeah. Thanks for the spoilers, Steph. Uh, <laughs> the important thing is that during the conference, you'll fi find some other talks. I was going through the schedule. Uh, I found these interesting talks from Elad, Nicholas. You guys should join, the, join these. David, I see you over there. You're talking about some of the services as well. I've seen some other people here who are passionate about this topic as well. So go grab them as well. Join their talks. Challenge them as well. Um, a, that, so that's the main thing here. So B, uh, we've thought about doing some sort of a competition about you contributing to open source services. I think we should still at some point do this that we'll, uh, would love to see your contributions as a result of DEF CONF. So after DEF CONF, if you contribute to any of the open services here, you want to send us your patch, we might actually send you something, some gift, if you do so as a result of this keynote, right? So we know we're successful. That's the way, right? Exactly. <laughs> and let, let's not pretend that this is easy. Solving this paradox is hard, but we do hard things. <laughs> and we do them amazing well and at scale. We have changed. Open source wasn't an easy thing either. 
We all worked hard to make that true. Um, this challenge is an exciting one, but it's, it's difficult. And when you believe, oh, this is a, this is a problem that, that's going to prevent this from progressing, for example, with, uh, with accessing data, that one comes up a lot. That just tells us that we need to work together to solve that problem. Join that workshop. Start to, to, to figure out with Tomas and with Neil um, how to solve that aspect. Bring an idea. Work together on this, and we will be able to solve it together. We'll solve this paradox. Perfect, perfect. I'm going to say these are the famous last words, right? Uh, so again, join us in these sessions. If you have any questions right now, we still have a couple minutes, so bring them up. OK, there you go first. Just yell it and we'll repeat it. Just quickly repeat that, please. So the, the question is, how do you solve the development environment problem um, where you can quickly bring up your change mm. and not have to wait days for an environment uh, that, um, <laughs> that you can run it in? <laughs> I would say we already have the solution, it's containers. I mean, we have the recipes, how to build them, so create them, and then use tooling to get them all together, and hopefully even with that production data inside, and you can have the development environment locally. Like for me, this is already solved. I know that can be still be improved uh, over time in future, but for me, it's done. So I I'm really curious what everyone here thinks about it, so feel free to approach me about it. <laughs> All right. Right. So the truth is that as you mentioned, some of the services are too huge to be run on your laptop. You need right. a playground. You need a testing environment. Body so join this awesome. workshop because <laughs> that's literally the thing that needs to be solved. And that, like Tomas said, already has a, uh, a working solution for the front end. But we really need a deeper solution. Like that is literally the, 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 the nut to crack. Mm. Totally agree. And I'm glad we're working on it together here. All right. I see, I see, I see one more question in the back first. I'll get to you, Lukashi. Who, someone was raising hand Pity had his hand up. Yeah. So it works for some projects. That's that's good to hear. Okay. Lukashi. So let me just say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect, perfect. Thanks, Lukashi. Anything else? Any last question? Oh, there's more. OK, hold on. I'll, I'll hand over the microphone to you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I noticed that licensing didn't come up as much during the talk. Do you think there's a perception that, li that licenses for open source services are, are maybe not so effective? If there is a perception like that, should it be changed? How could it be changed? How do you think open source and free software licensing fits into the picture that you're painting here? This is a good topic. Um, so how, how the, the challenge that we have is not that open source licenses don't work. They work fine. FOSS licenses work. GPL works for services. There's many licenses that even are, are uh, even more aggressive, like the AGPL on services. But they are insufficient. That because you don't copy 
or you don't need to copy the code that's running in, in software, they are not the enforcing mechanism. They're not the thing that actually underpins open source services anymore. And that is the problem. So they're, they're, they're good, but they're not sufficient for what we need to pull off here. I think that part of the challenge is also that you need to be able for someone who contributes, I'd say, live to a system, uh, let's say uh, the contributor is a banker or something like that, and they want to really make sure that what they have contributed is actually what is running on the other side. So I think that if you want to do that correctly, you also need to have uh, a, a really good chain of trust all the way, and I'm not trying to advertise for the talk that I'm going in one, one hour, but just in case. <laughs> so chains of, chains of trust are important. I think we are starting to know how to build that at the VM level, at the workload level, etc. Um, I'd like to advocate for building that in the programming language themselves, and that's hard. Uh, don't get me started on that, but that's really something that we need to probably some put some, some emphasis on. So really integrating that at the low level API level when, when you have an RPC mechanism that this RPC mechanism can not just send data over, but send a proof that the other side of the API was this version, that it executed in this environment, and it gives you a cryptographic proof that this went well. Otherwise, it fails spectacularly, and you know it failed. Okay, thank you. So this was very good advertisement for your talk. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for uh, solving one of the challenges. Yeah, and data, data security, data residency, these type of things, th those are all challenges for services. And, I, and yes, we do have some additional talks about uh, this type of problem here as well. Folks, anything else? Any other question? If not, uh, we'll let you go right now, grab some coffee. It's going to be exhausting three days, I can promise that. And thanks a lot, you've been a great audience. <laughs>